How many blessed people do I have in this house tonight? That's what I thought. Hallelujah. Are you ready? Revelation chapter 5. Turn there with me in your Bible. Revelation alert series number 8. The Lion, the Lamb, the Book. Let's begin reading in verse 1. I'm going to read the entire uh, scripture setting for tonight. Then we'll go to the outline and break it down. John writes, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and this has to be God the Father, a scroll written inside and on the back. Sealed with seven seals. This is quite frankly God's final will. What you and I would call a will and testament. This is God's final will. It's going to be quite interesting. Now what I, want you to, what I really want you to notice is this. When we were dealing with the seven churches of Asia. Everything was here on earth. And all of a sudden now we're in heaven. And we stay in heaven and enjoy the blessings and the benefits and the joy and the celebration and everything. In the meantime, there's two areas of activity, one taking place in heaven and one taking place on earth. How many of you are going to join me in taking place in the hell of heavenly celebrations? Amen? All right. We'll leave all that other stuff bent down here. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. In verse 2, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? One of the interesting things is who is this strong angel? Most commentaries will tell you it's Gabriel. And the reason they'll tell you it's Gabriel is because the name Gabriel translates strength of God. And it makes a point here to say strong angel. Verse 3, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I, John, wept much because no one was found worthy to open and to read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold. The Lion of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, the twenty-four elders, stood a lamb. At the beginning of that verse, John says, don't weep. Behold the lamb, the lion. Behold the lion. And he looked and saw a lamb. How do you see Jesus tonight? Sometimes I see him as a lamb. Sometimes I see him as a lion. In the Greek, the word lamb means little pet. And if you go back to the sacrificial lamb, they brought that lamb in the house to protect it and take care of it. And by the end of the year, just before that lamb was to be taken for sacrifice, it had become a pet. He had become a part of the family. The impact of having that lamb slaughtered on the children and the parents had to be very traumatic. I want you to understand that that should be the same feeling you and I have when we think of the fact that the Lamb of God lived with us, walked with us, he was with us, he's, he was for us, then he is in us, died for us. 
let's not lose the glamour or the impact of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so he looked and there stood a lamb as though he had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Wish I had a lot of time to spend on that, but we'll come back to it. Then he, Jesus, the lion, the lamb, came and took the stroll out of the right hand of him, the father who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the stroll, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the stroll, to open its seal, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God. We shall reign on the earth, talking about the millennium reign. John said, then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That was a Greek expression, which means innumerable host. You couldn't count them all. There's going to be a lot of people in heaven. For those of us that like to sit alone and be quiet, I'm afraid heaven is not the place you want to be in. It's noisy. Can you imagine an innumerable host of people singing? And they've got harps. I just pray that those harps are all tuned to the same key. Truthfully, in the Greek, the word harp means the strings of the heart. And so what you have is the strings of the heart making melody and praise unto the Lord, along with golden incense, which is praise and worship, and all the prayers of the saints. You and I have a part in watching God fulfill every prayer you have ever prayed. You say, well, what about, he'll take care of that one, too. Go ahead and read with me verse 12. Remember a while ago we read the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. Those seven eyes are the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God. And so verse 12 saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. And then it lists the seven spirits of God or the seven Holy Spirit all in Jesus to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Seven. You can find reference to this in Isaiah, and it would be mentioned two other times in the book of Revelation. Now, some of the words would be different, but it has the same meaning, okay? Now, how many of you noticed that Jesus came out of the throne and took the stroll from he who sat on the throne. Jesus said, as I am is in the Father, you are in me. And then the seven spirits of the Holy Spirit was in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit came and dwelt in us. And Jesus said, I would never leave you or forsake you. Then he turned right around and said, the Holy Spirit would never leave you or forsake you. How many of you have Jesus tonight? You've got the fullness of God's Holy Spirit in you right now. Oh, I tell you what, the thing that I have a problem with is not my spirit, it's my head. I forget who I am in Christ every once in a while. Amen? You understand what I'm saying? So read on with me, verse 13. Every creature 
and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such in the sea and all that's in them I heard saying blessings and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever and then the four living creatures said amen the 24 elders which represent the redeemed of the old and new testament the old and new covenant the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever Looking at your outline, after our orientation to the glory of God in last week's lesson, chapter 4, I got so excited in that. By the time I got out of here last Wednesday night from studying chapter 4, I was on cloud 9. The joy of the Lord was there. The peace of God was there. The excitement of God was there. I was ready to say, okay, Jesus, come on, let's get it over with. I want you to understand that chapter 4 and chapter 5 is to put joy and inspiration in the believers that are still here for the moment. We're about to have a grand old time. We've got something to look forward to. And so we look at chapter 5 and we have an introduction to the lion who is called the lamb and to a book or a scroll with seven seals. That scroll, whatever it's written on, It rolled up as such, sealed seven times, so that you break a seal and unroll it to a point. There's another seal. You break that seal, unroll it to another point, and you continue to do that. At each point, when it's completed, there's another seal. Now, the interesting thing is, in, in that hour, in that day and time, a scroll like that was a person's last will and testament, or a legal document, which meant that there had to be a witness, usually two witnesses, for the breaking of the seal. And that witness, or those two witnesses, had to have a legitimacy to be there for the breaking of the seal, which oftentimes meant their name was written there. Or they were like a lawyer or a legal representative of the court, and they had the authority to do this. And so what happens is this. John sees that there is a scroll in the throne and at the moment, he sees nobody is qualified to break the seal. He begins to weep because it meant that there was nobody there to honor the will of God. One of the elders said, it's okay, John, it's okay, don't weep. There is somebody here qualified to do the will of the Father. Behold the Lion of Judah. And he turned to see the Lion of Judah, and he said, Is he a little pet? A lamb. But John by now knows what's going on. Jesus comes forth and takes it. Now, it's written inside and on the outside. And so if I'm looking at the outside, what I see, not only is an authorization for the breaking of the seal, but I see a summary of what is on the inside. And so I look at the summary, ah, oh, it's talking about how to make spaghetti. Then I break it open and there's a recipe in detail. And so that's how the scroll works with seven seals. Now, go back to your outline. 
Letter A in the introduction. While the broken seals will release all the events of the seven year tribulation, the events in heaven during that time are fivefold. Two things I want to mention here. Number one, the seven year tribulation had nothing to do with the church, it had nothing to do with the redeemed. The seven year tribulation is actually the 70th week that we just studied when we were in the book of Daniel. This is God's final dealings with the nation of Israel and with the Jew. We'll break that down just a little bit more in a little while, but during that seven year tribulation, we call it, that great tribulation, the first three and a half years on planet Earth are wonderful. No problems. Everything's great. Everybody's making money, nobody's sick. The government and the nation are getting along together. Husbands and wives aren't fussing and fighting. Everybody's getting along fine. Then all of a sudden, right in the middle, things completely change because the Antichrist changes his whole purpose and focus. Now, in heaven, during the seven year tribulation, you and I are going to be involved. The first thing we're going to be involved in is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the judgment seat of Christ, we're not judged for our sins. Our sins were judged at the cross. The judgment seat of Christ has to do with the ministry and the calling that God put on our lives. What was my purpose for being on this planet? Was I called to be a gardener? Was I called to work at Walmart? Was I called to witness to that brother at my son's funeral? What was my calling? And so what happens is this, because you've been faithful over a few things, that will make you ruler over many things. So the whole thing about the judgment seat of Christ is placing us where we're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Now the next thing after that is the presentation of the saints. Think of it this way, you've got a wedding about to take place. The pastor and the groom walks in. The music is playing. And all of a sudden, in the back of the room, the doors open. And here comes the wedding party. And they walk according to the music. They're taking their time. Some of them walk fast, fast music. Some of them walk slow. Some of them do it the old traditional way. One step, pause, one step, pause, you know, this kind of thing. The presentation takes place. And at this moment, as I'm sitting in my chair, studying, going over my notes, and thinking about what I'd say tonight, I suddenly realize something. This could be a very trying moment. Because of the thousand times 10,000 plus thousands, in other words, an innumerable host, do you know that there's going to be a long line in heaven? There's going to be a long line at the judgment seat of Christ. And there's going to be a long line in the presentation of the saints. We will never get to the dinner table for the marriage supper of the Lamb before we are starving. Okay, I'm kidding. But that was what was going through my mind as I was looking at that. I'm thinking about with the presentation of the saints, ladies and gentlemen, and I present to you, Evelyn, and she comes walking in, and I present to you, Mikey, and he comes walk. how long are we going to do this, God, you know? First of all, time doesn't exist there, so it'll be quick. Thank you, Jesus, okay. It's going to be a long graduation, Mama. <laughs> the third thing is, after the presentation of the saints, of course, is the marriage supper of the Lamb. I think the marriage supper of the Lamb, if you remember, this is, uh, the, the way this takes place is the presentation of the saints takes place before heaven. Everybody takes their place at the table. And then you hear the band strike up to uh, the song of something about, here comes the chief, you know, that kind of thing. And then the doors swing open and in comes Jesus. And everybody goes into a roaring and a celebration. Yay, Jesus is here. He comes to the head of the table. He reaches down and picks up a cup and he says, 
And now, I drink this cup with you. It wasn't the first cup. It wasn't the second cup. It was the last cup. And it's called the cup of victory. And everybody's going to stand up. Everybody's going to lift their cup with Jesus. And as we drink, we're going to have a victory celebration. Can you hear the noise in heaven right now? Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't want to minimize this at all. It is a glorious celebration. It's beyond anything we can imagine. There hasn't been a party on planet Earth that's going to measure up to this. Mama's going to be there. Grandma's going to be there. The kids are going to be there. We're all going to be there. Hallelujah. The banquet is over with, and we will leave the banquet room to prepare for the second coming of Christ to planet Earth. In the rapture, he doesn't come to Earth. We meet him in the air. So the second coming of Christ is where we come back with him, riding on horses. The battle of Armageddon is the agenda. And you and I are not involved in that battle because when Jesus comes and the Antichrist comes to confront Jesus, Jesus simply opens his mouth and speaks the word of life called the two-edged sword. The battle is over with instantly. Yes, the blood flows to the horse's bridle. It fills the valley, the valley of Megiddo which is 184 miles long, at its widest point, four miles, at its closest point, 40 feet. That battle is over, and you and I move in to our positions. I have no idea what it's like, but I do know from Adam a couple of things that you and I will be able to do. Number one, there will be no doubts as to what we're supposed to do because we will have the perfect mind of Christ. We will know the perfect will of the Father. It has been revealed in this scroll. The second thing that I know is that just as Adam was in the beginning before the fall, able to control everything and speak things into existence, with the creative words of his mouth, you and I will have the ability to open our mouth and speak. And whatever we say, that's the way it is. If we say to this mountain, move, it moves. If we say to the fish, speak, it speaks. Somebody's asked the question many times, are there animals in heaven? Yes. All kinds. I don't think it's just one kind, I think it's all kinds. And you know what's so interesting about it? They talk. You see, animals talk now. They talk to each other all the time. You and I just think you can't understand them. But once in a while, we have a relationship. For example, I had a relationship with a squirrel one time, and I knew exactly what that squirrel was saying. Hello? I knew when he was happy and when he was unhappy. I knew when he was, <laughs> you know, I just, uh, I called him Jake. Jake was territorial, of course. And Jake liked to play little games. Jake liked to hide so that when I come walking through the house, he could jump on my shoulder and, boo, scare me. I would be coming in, you know, and I got my mind on something else, and all of a sudden here comes Jake, bam, right in the top of my head. And then hang on with those claws. Had an episode with Jake. Jake loved fried chicken. And so did I. And one Sunday afternoon, we had just finished eating fried chicken, and back in those days, I was not saved. I was a barbarian and ate with my hands. And I had chicken grease all over my fingers. And I got up from the dinner table to go wash my hands. 
And as I walked through the hallway, Jake jumped on my shoulder, and I said, oh, hi, Jake, and I reached up to pet him, and he smelled that chicken grease on my finger, and my finger got lodged in his teeth. And I'm shaking him, oh, he's holding on for dear life, and I'm doing this with Jake, and he's everywhere except off of my finger. I finally frightened him so that he let go and ran. I still have marks. Just want you to know that. I still have my finger though. <laughs> but I do want you to understand that you go from the marriage supper of the Lamb into the preparation for the return of Christ. And then that final event, which ends the seven year tribulation. Christ's second coming, and we're coming back to him to take our positions. So looking at your outline in section one, the lamb in the book, it is because of the cross that Jesus is worthy of the judgment you can open the scroll. He paid a price. When John was weeping, he was weeping over the failure of mankind to honor the Lamb, to honor God, to honor the Holy Trinity. When the scroll was revealed, Everybody knew, everybody in heaven knew what it was. The time had come for the reading of the will. And where is that one that is the executive and the executor of the estate? And in that brief moment, John sees no one. And John is remembering being one of the youngest, being the youngest of the disciples, walking with Jesus barely out of his teens and seeing the compassion, the love, and seeing the attitude of a servant and seeing a man willing to give of himself when nobody else seemed to even care. And when persecuted, he didn't raise his voice, he didn't respond. He just continued to grow in favor with God, man. John's remembering how he was beaten, how he was mocked, how he was ridiculed, crucified. He could remember hearing the voices of the people. He's standing there with a lot of people, but he also remembers standing in the courtyard with a lot of people saying, away with this man, away with this man, we want nothing to do with him. He began to weep. John told, don't weep. The executive is here because of the cross. Can I say it another way? Folk, you don't have to weep over anything in any situation in life because we have a Jesus who paid a price to cover anything and everything you and I would have to deal with on planet Earth. Amen. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Jesus has been there for all of it. <laughs> he said, I'll never leave you. When you're struggling, I won't abandon you. I'm right there for you. Hello. Now, those seven seals mean that a witness, or at least usually two, are required for the opening of the seals 
And the witnesses for these seals are the seven dispensations of time. I listed those in your outline. The definition of the word dispensation is a stated period of time. And during that stated period of time, God related to man by a certain standard or covenant. And the first dispensation that deals with that first seal is the dispensation of innocence. And it goes from the time God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul until Adam fell in the garden. During that time of innocence, do you know what God required of Adam? Just one thing. Have you ever thought about that? What was the one thing God required of Adam? Well, he was supposed to maintain the garden and everything. There was something for Adam to do. The only thing God required of Adam was fellowship. That was the whole deal. In the cool of the day. God and man walked together. Adam, I'm you, he didn't have a care in the world. If he was walking down the street and he decided, hey, you know, I'd really like to have a Whataburger. The minute he said Whataburger, poof, there's the Whataburger. When God told him to maintain everything, he said, tree, trim up, shape up. The tree went, hmm, trimmed up, shaped up. You have what you say. If you say to this mountain, be moved and cast into the sea, it will obey you. If you doubt not, hello. The dispensation of innocence ended when Adam learned the difference between life and death, blessings and curses. He was no longer innocent. Now Jesus had to pass the same test. If Adam went through the dispensation of innocence, Jesus has to go through something in his lifetime that matches up with that dispensation of innocence. And it was found when they had him on trial. And Pilate said, I find no fault with him. He passed the test. In other words, Jesus passed the test for all seven dispensations of time. The second dispensation of time is called the, the dispensation of conscience. And this went from the fall of Adam to Noah. Now, when you get to Noah, God said that I've had it with these people. These people have done everything except turn to God or talk to God or fellowship with God. They've been doing their own thing and they have become perverted. There was not one on the planet that had a consciousness of God, save Noah. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God said, Noah, it's time for me to change things. How many of you have had that moment in your life when God said, it's time for me to change things? You know, as a child, you and I went through a dispensation of innocence. And as we became older, we came to that dispensation of consciousness of knowing right and wrong and having to make choices. And thank God for those of us that had parents that tried to point us in the right direction, but the choice was still ours. So how did Jesus pass the test of this dispensation of time, dispensation of conscience, when he was a 12-year-old boy? Notice how this all fits into the stages of life. He was a 12-year-old boy. He was in the temple asking questions and giving responses that the priest was marveling at. And Mary and Joseph is looking for him. And they finally find him. And he said, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Why were you looking for me? She, he could have said, what are you looking for? 
He went home with them and was a subject to them. And the scripture says that he grew in favor with God and man. Noah came off of the ark and started a whole new dispensation. A dispensation of time called government. And this is going to last all the way up to Abraham. And at that time, the government, so to speak, the leadership of the people were responsible for their salvation. They were, the, the leadership of the people were responsible. How many of you were perfect teenagers? How many of you remember that you were not even legal until you were 18? Who was responsible for you? The government in the house was responsible for you. Hello? And the government in the house could be kind of awesome sometimes, governing. <laughs> but the same thing is true here from Noah to Abraham. And when we get to Abraham, you'll understand where Abraham said, Look, I know where these idol gods are coming from. This is not real. I want something that's real. And he's going to start a different move. I'll come back to that in just a minute. Let's go back. Did Jesus solve the government problem? Yes. They came to Jesus and asked him, do you need to pay taxes? He said, you have any money? Give me a quarter, a coin, you know. Somebody handed him a coin. He held it up and said, whose face do you see on here? Caesar. Render to Caesar what belonged to Caesar, but render to God what belonged to God. My, my, my. How many of you favor your mama? How many of you favor your daddy? How many of you favor the dog? How many of you don't know? <laughs> but, you know, the whole idea is we are stamped with an image of our inheritance. Mama, daddy, whatever. But there comes that moment where render honor and respect unto your parents and your grandparents and your family heritage and legacy. But render to God what belongs to God. And Abraham stepped back one day and said, no disrespect, Mom. No disrespect, Dad. But it's time for me to find God and honor him. His nephew Lot said, I'll go with you. And they took off not knowing where they were going. But what you have from Noah to Abraham Jesus fulfilled it when he said, render to God what belonged to God. Amen. I want to say it again. Render to God <clears throat> what belongs to God. Let's try this. How many of you belong to God? Have you rendered that? Let's try another one. How many of you? are familiar with the teaching that the tithe belonged to the Lord. Have you honored that? How many of you realize you have talents and a calling and a purpose? Render unto God or belong to God. Awesome. And so a new dispensation of time is called the dispensation of promise, and it goes from Abraham to Moses. God said to Abraham, come go with me, and I will make you the father of many nations. I will bless you, and I will bless your descendants. And Abraham, everything you see I give it to you and to your children. Abraham, the tent dweller, never built himself a house, moved from mountaintop to mountaintop, seven mountaintops in his lifetime, because he found out when he stood on top of the mountain, he could see further. And God said, if you can see it, 
You can have it. Get off of your hill and climb a mountain. Some of us have settled for what's in the valley. I've got no problem with the valley. There's green grass in the valley. There's still waters in the valley. But folk, let me tell you something. The gold is in the hills. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to us. Am I doing okay? Now, this lasted up into Moses. The covenant, the dispensation of promise. And how did Jesus fulfill the dispensation of promise? He said, I no longer call you servants, but friend. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that we may be together. We're family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're the family of God. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. With a heavenly home and a heavenly hope and a heavenly victory. Ow. Moses comes on the scene and we have a dispensation of law. We're more familiar with that than we are the others probably. The dispensation of law lasted from Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt until the birth of the church. God gave the Ten Commandments, and the subcopies under those Ten Commandments added up to 532 little commandments. How in the world are we going to? figure out. You know what? I, some of you would have a problem telling me what the Ten Commandments are. You would never make it through the 532 subcopies. Just to help you out a little bit, the first four has to do with God. The last six has to do with man. And there was a fellow that came to Jesus one day. He was befuddled about all these rules and regulations. He said, I can't do all of this, God. Jesus, what can I do? He said, Jesus said, I'll give you two. He summed it all up in the two commandments. The first four. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the last six. Love your neighbor as yourself. How many of you love you? You love yourself. How many of you can say, I love me? How many of you say, I don't like me sometimes? Oh, don't raise your hand on that. Don't raise your hand on that, okay? But the whole deal is this. We have an attitude about ourselves, and the attitude I have about me is going to affect the attitude I have about you. Can I trust me? If I can trust me, I'll trust you. But if I don't trust me, I have a problem trusting other people. Do I think I'm good stuff? I'm not talking about being egotistical. Or do I have a defeated mentality, I'm just no good. That attitude I have about me is the kind of attitude I'm going to have about you. And so there has to be something happening in the first four commandments in my relationship with God so that I can have the right and healthy attitude about myself in the last sixth commandment to love my neighbor as myself. Mm -mm -mm. Now, Jesus said concerning the law, the dispensation of the law, I did not come to do away with it. I came to fulfill it. Every iota of the law Jesus fulfilled. You just thought he was walking up and down the shore of Galilee, feeding the multitudes. You just thought he was walking on the water. You just thought he was trying to tell the guys how to catch fish. No. Jesus 
had 532 points that had to be fulfilled before his ministry on earth was complete. And you and I do not have to fulfill any of those except to love God and love your neighbors yourself. Can I do that? How many of you can say, I can love God? How many of you can say, I can love you as I love myself? Hello? Some of us maybe still be growing a little bit. Okay. But the dispensation of law ends on the day of Pentecost with the birth of the church. And it it is known as the dispensation of grace. And in this dispensation of grace, it will last until the rapture. And we're out of here. Now, has this dispensation been fulfilled? Has the victory for this dispensation been fulfilled? Dispensation means a measure of time. With God, there is no time, so it's not an issue in heaven. The issue is down here. And because we deal with time, this dispensation has not been fulfilled. It will be fulfilled at the rapture. That is why the rapture must take place. And that is another reason why the rapture will take place before the tribulation begins. So I'm definitely pre-trib. And this is what I like. What was Jesus' comment about the church? Peter said, you're the Christ, the anointed one with the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage. Jesus said, Peter, you, Peter, Petro, piece of the rock. And on you, a piece of the rock. And on you, a piece of the rock. And on you, another piece of the rock. And on you, another piece of the rock. All of us are part of the rock. We're safe. And he added this, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. How many of you are part of the rock tonight? Hell can't beat you up. The devil has no authority over you. You are a winner. You're an overcomer. You're going out of here in a blaze of glory. You got the victory. You're going to be standing in the banquet hall when the door swings open and the man of the hour walks in and holds the cup up and says, Now, let's have the victory. Hallelujah. (laughs) <laughs> the final dispensation dispensation of peace it's a measure of time called a thousand years and Jesus will fulfill that in the millennium when the lion will lie down with the lamb. Amen. Folks, I want to tell you something. You have walked through what we call the seven stages of life. I illustrated the first three about being a child, mom and dad taking care of growing up, coming to teenager, finally said, Hey, look, Mom, Dad, thank you. I'm back off. Abraham, I am now responsible for me. These are the seven stages of life. Whether you like it or not, you're in one of them right now. Amen. Point number two in your outline, Daniel's 70th week, which we'd studied when we did the book of Daniel, chapter 9. I mentioned that the dispensation of law is not finished. If you remember, <clears throat> in Daniel we learn that God is dealing with the Jews and all of a sudden he puts it on hold. And the church comes on the scene. And God, because the Jews rejected Jesus, goes to the world, goes to the Gentiles, as we would say, to the heathens, the pagans. And we have the church age. At the end of the church age, which is what the seven-year tribulation is really all about, 
is Daniel's 70th week, God's final dealing with the Jews. Actually, it's God's final dealings in three areas. It's his final dealing, if you look at the outline under letter B, it's his final dealing with the Jews, the judgment of nations, and Satan's kingdom. He's got three things going on all at one time. The seven-year period, the seventh week of Daniel, is really all about the Jew and them coming to, and accepting Christ. But in the meantime, he's got to deal with the devil. And he's going to put an end to the devil's kingdom. The devil winds up in the lake of fire forever. And at the same time, there has to be that judgment of the nations. What has the nation done with the gospel message? For example, Turkey is the home of the seven churches of Revelation. Turkey, from the beginning, was a Christian nation. Today, it's a Muslim nation. And it's drifting away from Muslims to what we would call socialism, communism, butting up with people like Russia and Iran. How is God going to deal with Iraq? How is God going to deal with Saudi Arabia? How is God going to deal with China? I don't know. I'm glad I don't have to worry about that. That's his business. I'm sure he'll readjust God. And so that's what's going to happen during the seven-year tribulation. Daniel's 70th week is fulfilled. Now, one of the things that I have learned over the years is that everything in Jesus' life, <clears throat> every single day of his life, was a fulfillment or a shattering a type that had to do with God's design. One day Jesus said, I need to go to Samaria. No Jew would go through Samaria. They were half-breeds. They were renegades. They were social rejects. And so when a Jew had to go from Galilee to Jerusalem for a feast, he would cross the Jordan River over onto the east bank and come all the way down 90 miles and add about another 20 miles to his trip by doing that. And then come up from Jericho so he wouldn't have to go through Samaria. And one day Jesus says to his disciples, I need to go to Samaria. All this time he's been dealing with the Jews and now all of a sudden he stepped totally out of character. He stepped totally out of what he's been teaching them. Said, I need to go to Samaria. They didn't argue with him. I'm sure they had plenty of questions. And so they get to town. Jesus sits down at the well, says, go find us some lunch. And while he's sitting there, this woman walks up, a prostitute. The worst of the worst in the worst place. To make a long story short there. She wanted to argue about worshiping God. Where? That's where Jesus made the proverbial statement. The time is coming when you will not worship God in Jerusalem. Or in the mountain. But you will worship him in spirit. And in truth. Are we living in a time like that now? So many people, I, I was just listening to somebody talk the other day. They have not been inside of the church since COVID-19 hit. Over a year, a year and a half, they've not been in church. He said, I visited my church last Sunday. That was the strangest feeling I've ever had. Hello. Do we worship God here? I've been in another country, I won't mention the name of the country, but I've been in another country where the people in that country, predominantly Catholic, believe that God's in the church building. But not necessarily out on the street. I mean, that's where they believe. And so when they go to church and they're faithful to church, 
they get inside the building and they get this holy awe about them and they're very res respectful and very religious, you know, just doing all the right things and everything. But as soon as they step back out on the street, their whole lifestyle changes. Are we that way? The woman went and told her, the people, the men of the city, come and meet a man that told me all about myself. And Jesus wound up staying there two days before returning to the Jewish side of town. It's a shadow and a type of the church age. As the day is with the Lord is a thousand years, the church age is two days long. And Jesus came to the Jew, and at a certain point, Jesus said, I must go to the Gentile. And after 2,000 years, he goes back to the Jew. And he fulfills Daniel's 70th week. I need to wrap it up. So quickly, on, on the back side of your outline, point three, the lamb is worthy, the song of the redeemed. This was declared by the angel to encourage John. Jesus is worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised in his uniqueness. He's worthy to be praised in our worship. He's worthy to be praised in our ministry. He's worthy to be praised in his kingdom. And you and I are the kingdom of God. The redeemed. How many of you, how many of you are the redeemed? Amen. The redeemed celebrate because of the price of redemption. His blood. The, object, the objective of redemption, you and me, man. The purpose of redemption, the Father's good pleasure. The result of redemption, you and I made kings and priests unto God. And the glory of redemption is that we have been made like Christ. God bless you. Have a good one. We'll see you later.